Hi, folks. Welcome to this next Wednesday webinar. It's being held on the 13th of November, and I'm very, very pleased to have Alex and Matthew, who are our special guests. I'll be introducing them in just a minute. Thank you to everyone who's joined us live, and thank you for all the people who are watching the recording of this in the next series. We've only got one more after this for this year, and that's our special Teach Meet, which I'll tell you a little bit about at the end of this session. So that will round up our Wednesday webinars for this year. Let me share my screen so we can have a look at what we have got planned for today. So the focus of this particular is all about Photoshop, creative use of Photoshop, and we've got a very exciting uh, presentation for you from a student at uh, Trinity Grammar in Sydney named Matthew, and we'll introduce him formally in a minute. There he is waving, which is lovely. And he's done some incredible work. You can see a little sample, just a tiny little sample of this amazing work on the screen, on our shared screen at the moment. Before we do introduce Matthew and his wonderful teacher, Alex, we're going to just start our formal Wednesday webinar introduction. Thank you for joining this Wednesday webinar with the ANZ Adobe Education team. Note that we are recording this session, so please mute your microphone. In the spirit of reconciliation, Adobe acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Indigenous Australians. To fully engage with this webinar, please do keep your webcams on if you are able. If you would like to workshop along with the presenter, we encourage you to use two screens or two devices, one to view the presentation and the other to access the software. This avoids constantly flicking between windows. If you do miss any content, note that you can always refer back to the recording. Please use the chat feature to ask questions or share comments and most importantly, make the most of this professional learning opportunity from Adobe. Now it's over to the Adobe Education Team. A couple of little announcements for you before we get started with our guests. The next update of our newsletter is, is coming out. It's now available if you want to go into that link to have a look at it. We haven't actually shared it across our whole audience yet because there's still one or two articles that I'm wanting to put on. So I'm actually holding off making it totally public until we've made a couple of special announcements that I can't really share with you now, but they're going to be well worth watching for. But let me just give you a taste of what the newsletter is looking like. When you go into that link, and I'll put that link into the chat for those who are with us live as well, so you can have quick access to it. Uh, you can see that uh, our first article is about Adobe Express for Education and the guided activities, which if you haven't discovered yet, they're amazing. And they're just wonderful ways of getting started in any sort of curriculum area, just a little um, teaser to get the kids started using Adobe Express. You don't have to know much about Adobe Express because it's a guided activity, which is rather cool. Our Wednesday webinars as a promotion for those. The Game Changer Challenge happened last week in, with the New South Wales Department of Education. I flew up to Sydney for that event and it was just spectacular, really enjoyed it. I'm going to play a little clip about that in a couple of minutes. There's a story about uh, our Adobe Day at Kingswood High in New South Wales and um, Mitchell High School visited the Adobe office in Sydney a couple of weeks ago. Braybrook College visited the Adobe office in Melbourne a couple of weeks ago. Some stories about that and then a few stories that are focused from our global team. Uh, information about Adobe Max and other resources from Adobe Express that could be very interesting for you. So please enjoy those articles in the newsletter. There will be a couple more, at least one more article that we'll be hopefully publishing either tonight or tomorrow, which is a special announcement, particularly for Victorian teachers. That's all I'm going to say at this point. And uh, if uh, I'd encourage you to also share that link to your colleagues and just let them know that this newsletter is available for them on a monthly basis just to keep them inspired and up to date with the world of Adobe in education. Now I told you I was going to play a little clip from the Game Changer Challenge. I've created three videos from the Game Changer Challenge. You can actually have a look at all of them with the link that's down the bottom right hand corner and I'll put that into the chat for those people who are with us live. 
and you can have a look at all of them, give you a taste of what the Game Changer Challenge is all about. This is the sixth year that the New South Wales Department of Education have run it. It's the, the largest design thinking event in the Southern Hemisphere. That's right, it's absolutely huge. And Adobe Express for Education played a big part. Some of our kids learn about Adobe Express and they found it so beneficial in creating animation, which will really help with their pitch tomorrow. And it was just so quick and easy. Well, how many times have you been involved in the Game Changer Challenge before? This is our first time. First time, that's fantastic. Now, how many times have you used Adobe Express before? I've never used it before this event. So what did you think of it the first time you used it? It was really fun. You can create whatever you like and it was just family friendly and easy to use. Have you used it before, Archie? No, I have not used it. And what about, did you agree with Bethany that it was easy to use? Yeah, the animation is a game changer. Adobe Express has lots of features that other apps don't have and it's really an all-in-one package that you don't really need much else to use. I personally like using Adobe Express because it has like a variety of things that it offers and it's basically like an all-in-one platform for your graphic design needs. I think Adobe Express is a very cool, easy way for um, students and especially kids to learn to start animating. A bunch of our girls went to the Adobe Express session um, mostly to find out the capabilities. It's something that we haven't used a lot in the classroom and all three of us were really impressed with uh, all the things you could do. They now decided to use Adobe Express. The, the AI element is amazing. The fact that you could animate uh, pretty much anything and have it speak in your voice, they found that really powerful. Um, and they're going to use that to have talking fruit uh, as part of their health food push. First time is quite like myself. F found it quite easy, easy to just start on and go on and do whatever you want. I'm going to continue using Adobe Express because it has a lot more features that other apps don't have. I think Adobe Express, it was really interesting, like uh, the way they use the AI and to create like different like mouth moving features and like characters and I thought it was really cool like with the background and how you could like change um, the background like with the AI as well and like the voice and it had like really cool options like with the media and like you could upload your own pictures into it as well and it was, I thought it was really cool. I really like the website feature on Adobe Express because like it's, a lot, it's really easy just to create a website and you can use it for a lot of things like if you're starting a business for example or even like if you're doing a project for school and yeah and everything like that. This has been made with Adobe Express. There we go. So it was lovely to see Adobe Express being really utilised at the Game Changer Challenge. All right, let's bring Matthew and Vicky up onto the screen. I've got a picture here, just gives you a tiny little sample of what Matthew has created with Photoshop and with Firefly, but I'm going to let him actually explain a bit more about it. And let's introduce them first. Matthew and Vicky, can you open up your cameras if you haven't already? Yeah, we're here now. We're here, sorry. Uh, hi, I'm Alex Matthew, and um, we are actually able to share our screen now, uh, Tim. Uh, oh, great. Whereas before we didn't have admin rights, so uh, you can let us know when we're, we're able to share our screen with you. Well, let's, just in, let's find out a bit about you guys before we start sharing. Sure. So, Alex, you're a, you're a teacher at Trinity. Tell us a bit how long have you been there and what do you actually teach? Uh, well, I've actually been here for quite a while. So this is my 13th year. Uh, teaching. I specialise mainly in photography and digital media, but if, we, if you're thinking of a specialty area. My background is I have a master's in, in film and uh, photography and uh, fine arts undergraduate. And so, yeah, I, I suppose I ran a lot of the photography and digital media courses over that time. Uh, I started teaching Matthew when he was in year so seven yep. and then when he came into year nine he was really into photography we run a, a photography co-curricular club after school so yeah there's a lot that has been going on over the years and yep. the work we've been doing i've uh, been teaching photoshop and adobe 
on the platforms for uh, some a long time now. And yeah, it's very much a big part of what we what we do here at school. So right. thanks, yeah. Alex. So Matthew, you're in year twelve this year. So yes. congratulations. It's all finished Thank now you. for you. What was that again? It's all finished now. You finished school. You, you yeah, definitely... I finished finished a week ago, and I'm all done now. Wonderful. Yeah. It's exciting. A very exciting time of life. And Matthew, tell us uh, a little bit about what your plans are for when you do finish uh, leave school. What are you planning to do next year? Yeah, so my plans next year is to do landscape architecture at UNSW um, and maybe on the side I might do some wedding photography. To get, nice. Yeah, to get doing photography, yeah. Excellent. So how long has photography yeah. been a passion for you? I think since about early 2019 was, um, was when it really kicked off for me. Um, and it's been a yeah big journey since then for me. And what is it that you love about photography? I just think it's, it's such a real way to capture the world. Um, like you've got like painting and drawing, it's very up to the artist's mind as to how to present the world, but photography captures the world as it is. And I really love that. You just get to capture the raw beauty of what's in front of you. I've got a very controversial question for you, Matthew, and this is what, something that I often ask professional photographers. In fact, it, it, don't be surprised if uh, you're watching a vision of the MCG where it might be Boxing Day test match and there's professional photographers all around the ground and suddenly you see me going and, and knocking on their, their shoulder and saying this question. Tell me, Photoshop or Lightroom? So, Matthew, Photoshop or Lightroom? Lightroom all the way. There you go. Good. So why Lightroom? Well, I just think it's a lot easier to get through a thousand photos in half an hour than it is to get through a thousand photos in Photoshop. So you get to batch edit all of your photos in the exact same way, whereas Photoshop, you know, you've got one photo at a time, Lightroom, you can look at a gazillion photos. Nice. It's a lot easier for batch editing. Matthew, I'm going to get you to share your screen now because something very exciting happened with your work that you created. We're about to see like the finished product in a very special context. Alex, could you explain what the context is that we're about to see when we have a look at this little video that is on this website? Uh, yeah, so we um, at Trinity were involved with professional learning teams, one of which is involved with UTS University at the moment. Uh, in our um, research into AI in education. So myself and a few other colleagues are involved in a part of a writing team with UTS. And I was invited on Monday to show, to present Matthew's work in their data arena, which is a 360 degree room with around 16 cameras and how many megapixels? 32K megapixels, like 32 million pixels. So, yeah, 32 million pixels. So. For us, that was a, a really um, amazing experience to be able to see the work at such an incredible resolution and size and scale. So we managed to capture a video of that um, on Monday and we can just display that to you now. So we're skimming through the website. We'll come back and have a look at those features that we're skimming through. But this clip on YouTube, this kind of is the finished product. So let's have a quick look at it. And while we're looking at it, Matthew, can you explain to us what it is, what we're actually looking at here? Yeah, so this is this is my work presented in the UTS's data arena. Um, I created it using Photoshop's AI. Um, and it's, yeah, it's about 12 photos that have been stitched for lack of a better word together using the ai tools to create one cohesive landscape that yeah seamlessly blends to be one that's amazing how, how big is that like we how, what's the scale that we're looking at here that scale is floor to ceiling height that's the scale so you can kind of see that the the computer there just yeah, so to get a last frame um glitch and the black is the floor and the black of the top there is the roof so it's at, um, you know, it's the height of the It would have been about 12 metres around. 12 metres, yeah. yeah. So the work itself was... It was uh, 10 metres by meters. half a metre. Amazing. Yeah. This is a bit bigger than that, yeah. But we, <laughs> we did have to edit it down from 20 metres to um, yeah, to, to 10 to yeah. be at restriction. To be within the restrictions. Besides for submission. restrictions for submissions for HSC and... We received word on the Monday afternoon after we presented the work that Matthew's work has been um, nominated for Art Express 
So that's also exciting for, for Matthew yeah, and for us here as well. Wonderful. You're getting lots of reactions from our live audience here. Lots of congratulations and some shock emojis about just how much work you've put into here. So, Matthew, when did you start the project? Uh, I started the major work projects in, in um, it would have been about November last year. Um, but this, this idea of doing the panorama only came to rise and proper fruition in January this year. So if we scroll down a little bit. Um, yeah, tell us a bit about the process. Yeah, so you can see my, my initial idea in November last year was to capture, yeah, the way that photography is transformed over time and in both the way that it's captured from like film cameras to digital cameras and then now to AI. And then also how, yeah, how, the means by which people, how, so like how, how, um, yeah, how, how people capture the photographs. Um, and it was really driven by my, yeah, love for love photography and love for the way the camera is constructed and the intricate beauty. So you can see in these photos here, there's some of my original photos of a box brownie camera and a Leica, um, just to show the beauty of, yeah, old film cameras. So you, you took a lot, you, you started taking photographs with film and yeah. experimented a lot with, um, with uh, film cameras as well, because we thought initially, we might be able to use the the film as overlays on yeah. top of some the digital work. Uh, so it was really about how we could incorporate old techniques and technologies with new and emerging technologies such as AI. Mm. Yeah, but I came to realise that it was yeah quite difficult to to show that. Um, and then I realised I, I saw um Toma Goetz's exhibition. She's a Russian photographer who uses AI to capture like post-Soviet societies and the, the, the yeah, like the, the, the shift in societies can see just use AI in these pictures, like fully AI scenes to create, yeah, depictions of, of yeah, modern society. And then that prompted me to consider, yeah, both AI as an art form and yeah, using AI as the major feature in my major work. So you've got some annotations here and some storyboarding. Tell us, tell us a bit about this. Yeah, so you can see in this top section, this is the first idea that I had of doing a joint landscape. And you can see in these sections down the bottom that I've tried to capture yeah, the idea of, of capturing cameras across time because the panorama was initially going to be capturing a shift in time, like going from old landscapes to new landscapes, going from black and white film photography to modern purely AI photos. And then that'll be mirrored on the bottom by, yeah, changing camera technology and the people who use it, essentially. Very detailed, it's great. Mm. And yes. the next question here, how we developed, yeah. just the, sort of the screen, yeah, show us the progress here. Yeah, so I suppose for tech, this was a big part, um, of the process because Matthew has so much photography um, and he's constantly shooting. It was really looking over, he has a website and I would just look over constantly asking him to upload more photographs to a shared file. And then I print all the images out and start to work out where we were pairing and we would, we would print and pair. And so I kind of flick through all of his work and then start to make some connections. And then I would say to him, I think you need to shoot, X, Y, Z, and it might be where I, I, I felt like a, we were, something we were missing. That could have been, um, you know, a night landscape then to match in to, so that's just an image there, or to match into another image that was strong. So that was really a big part of the process was working out what we, we wanted to use and then trying to visualise what potentially could, could be the next point to join uh, with the work. Another part of the work that Matt hasn't mentioned there is that he did create a, a book that also went with the work, and I think you've included one. Yes, yeah, down yeah. towards the bottom. And um, that's the book there that he's holding. Because I suppose the interest was that it was a fam his family had always taken photographs, his grandfather, his father. So it was also his love and nostalgia for film. So I'd asked him to go and track down his grandfather's old photographic slides 
and he scanned those in. And initially we were thinking of how we could incorporate some of these slides or, you know, your, your beautiful um, cedachrome, really rich toned images, maybe it could work in with this larger panoramic, but it ended up the resolution we couldn't get high enough and yeah. there was different things like that that were involved. So he then created a book and this is the book that goes with the work. So as you can see here, we have images that are the scanning of his grandfathers and then he, he paired in um, images of uh, his own there too. And that down the bottom of that, you can see the information of the camera, the film, the stock. Um, so it really was a, a tribute to photography over a period of time. Yes, and, and his family as well. Yeah. Well. Yeah. And I think as well, part of this process too was where we found Photoshop really helpful was um, being able to use the FX in Photoshop where you can look at film stock. Mm. And so you can go through and you can say, okay, well, we're using a Kodachrome and, you know, you're knowing that you're needing to look for warm kind of colours there. And then you can use those those effects as overlays to then try to pair in his work to to work well with the to match the um, historic work. Um, so yeah, you can see an image on the right hand side there of his grandfather's slide, and then one on the left of Matthew's waterfall. Yeah, so I've tried to match the purple tones of the mountains on my grandfather's photo, and now using an FX filter on my photo, which are traditionally like a very monochrome black and white photo and then brought in some purples and some yeah rich reds into that photo to match them together yeah. and, and even i think with that larger panoramic work where or i was always looking very much at tones and colors and light and if it wasn't right i would then direct him to go out and shoot and it was very much a process that um i probably would have been in conversation with yeah. his mum over a period of time and we'd have a chat and she'd say oh Alex where do you where do you need him to go what do you need to do and I'd say okay look I think he would benefit from going down to Bondi down along the rock platforms along there at 5 a.m in the morning to capture this particular light hitting this particular surface yeah. so then we can bring it back and start to match so yeah, yeah. it was very much a process of working mm. out what mm. his strongest images were, but then working out what we really what needed to really shoot. Yeah. Uh, and then editing that as much together as we, we could, which you can see here, I've got Matt up on our classroom wall. Um, this is the final panoramic here, but- um, Printed on individual printed A4 Printed on sheets. individual A4 sheets, but it was a process and um, of actually yeah, trying to get everything to mm. match. But what Matt and I found, because I think we probably started looking at working in AI, it would have been, um, we played around a bit with it in when he was in year 11, yeah, but then we started to really focus on it at the end of last year. Yeah. And what we noticed with working with um, Photoshop was just how much it's progressed, mm. even in a six-month pe six period yeah. time of the new generations of how things, how well things were working, that some generations that we'd made earlier in, in the year, we Matt went back and redid yeah. because the technology had improved in that period of time where you could, you were, the generations that were coming out were just really incredible. Yeah, just constantly getting better. You yeah. had so much to choose from. So I suppose with, when you're working with really strong quality images and, um, you know, things are really high res, you you are able to make such seamless transitions within the platform, which was um, really impressive for us to, to get to that point yeah. in the process. So I can let you talk about that, man, if you like. Yeah. Um, if we, if we, we don't have a big image of the panoramic. Sorry for scrolling, everybody. <laughs> yeah, so stop? I can talk about a little bit how I've used Photoshop's tools to create the images, the desired results. Yeah, and so, Matt, before you do, just um, letting our live audience know, this would be a good opportunity to throw in some questions and some comments maybe in the chat. Uh, Tim Cosgrove from Canada is with us. He said, amazing work using the latest features of Photoshop. So much potential. Thanks, Tim. Anyone else, feel free to just throw in some comments and questions to Matt and or to Alex. Over to you, Matt. Yeah, so one of the tools I used primarily was the dodging and burning tool. And this is one of my favorite photos that I've taken in New Zealand. Um, and straight out of the camera, it's an all right, it's a pretty good image, but to fit the needs of the panorama, it needed to have a big like kick in the lighting. 
So I use the burning tool to yeah, pull in the highlights and make those sunbeams really pop out and stick out and be prominent in the image. And then I also use the burning tool to darken the shadows to really up the contrast without yeah, losing detail and degrading the overall quality of the image like it would in Lightroom. Um, so you're going back to your question earlier, Tim. I guess there are there are benefits to using Photoshop over Lightroom <laughs> for, for, for yeah professional use. Um, Matt, you don't happen to have Photoshop opened at the moment, do you? On yeah, your we do. We do have it open. Yeah, we can get are it. Are you able to just give us an example for those who don't know that particular technique? Are you able to show us how to access it? Yeah. So um, I haven't used it on this layout before. It's in, I think it's under the Control click. Um, just here. Yeah, yeah here we go. Yeah. The, the burn tool. Set it just click there and just press OK. Yeah. So, so say in, in a section like this, I can just, I'm, I'm on the wrong layer. Look at all those layers. There are quite a few. I think I had, had about 60 at one stage. Yeah, the file is so large. It's like an eight gigabyte file. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you've got the burn and then the dodge, and you can work on your midtones and your shadows. Yeah. So it'd be often I'd I suppose a long time of mine spending dark rooms. That's, that's a bit. Um, of... to to explain, you know, are we looking at shadows, midtones? What are you actually wanting to correct? Yeah. So that really is a process, and also looking at the exposure opacity as well. Um, yeah. and playing around with that and then again the opacity of what you're doing yeah exactly just on the layer itself and can come the dodge tool over into the light rays and make it in yeah just like that it looks better already just yeah, with a few smokes. yeah so it really was a fine playing around so much with these kind of mm. The amount the, of what you're doing with your exposure and and looking at at the midtones, mm. I feel like I would always say to Matt, get it right in camera first. Yeah. So yeah. I would get the boys to come back with their proof sheets. Sheets a lot of the time, I print out their images with looking at their um, aperture and yep. their, all of those things to try and say get it right in camera first. And then when it comes to editing in Photoshop, you're not having to do too much, but I feel like those areas there are definitely looking mm. at exposure instead of, you know, you've yeah. got your curves, but um, that part of the process yeah, is really important exactly. when you're looking at those fine details. Yeah. yeah. And Matt, uh, a question that I'm sure probably is going to come up in the chat in a minute, but um, the question that I have for you is when you originally shot these, did you shoot in RAW? I did shoot in RAW, yeah. And for those who are, not, who are not sure what that actually means, would you be able to explain, Matt, what shooting in RAW means and why you would choose to do that over uh, shooting in as a JPEG, for instance? So a RAW file is, yeah, it's, 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 it's exactly what it says. It's the RAW file straight out of the camera. It's had no processing done by the camera's internal computer. It's purely what the camera sees on the sensor and saves that to a file. So I prefer using RAW files because it captures the whole dynamic range of the scene and it leaves the colors as true to the scene as it is. Whereas in saving as a JPEG, uh, my camera might alter the colors and make it seem, yeah, slightly different to what it is. And yeah, by using a RAW, it allows me to put it into Photoshop and lets me- and maximum uh, capacity. Yeah, maximum capacity. And yeah, lets me push it and pull it as much as I need to to fit my needs, which a yeah. JPEG doesn't let you. And not every camera shoots in RAW, it's worth keeping that in mind, but most of the DSLRs do and most of the, the sort of main um, cameras that many schools have got, you've got that RAW feature. And that's a good bit of advice for people is to actually originally do your shooting in RAW because you can always compress later. But if you're shooting in a, a compressed format, then as Matt said, you, you won't have necessarily the full features to be able to um, work with. What else can you show us, Matt, if you if you want to sort of pan across? Um, I guess another question I've got for you, and just a reminder, those people, people who are with us live, good opportunity now to be throwing some questions in the chat. Can you tell us um, uh, what is real and what is AI in terms of what we're looking at here? Yeah, so uh, let me zoom out a little bit. Um, so I'll go back to... This is, this is oh yeah, it's one of one of the easiest sections to show where the AI is. Um, also underneath on the white border, we printed it so you can see that transition of of what he has 
uh, put into AI. Yeah. Um, as part of the artwork itself. Mm. So um, can, yeah, on the bottom there's text that shows the prompt that I fed the AI program to so oh, generate okay. a smooth transition from a black and white Alpine Lake to a coastal rock platform. Um, so you selected an area in Photoshop and added the prompt. Is that correct? Yeah. And then that, that was the AI just there. Yeah. So you can see two individual photographs. Yep. And then AI in the middle. Fantastic. Look at that. It's amazing. It's so clever, then, isn't it? I think some of these transitions where Matt's moving the screen now were a little bit more challenging yeah. when we're going from you know this the um the the star, star trail, trail yeah. into the rock pool with the water there and the trees so um as you can see some of the other versions that i had yeah which are pretty pretty average in my opinion yeah and you're kind of losing the com you're compromising the actual strength of his, yeah. his work so that's where i feel like we probably had to come in and, and edit and tidy up with masks and things yeah. like that to mask layers to make it look as more seamless yeah. but that would be that that's a very tricky gener generation for for um yeah for the ai to for do. the ai to be able to to match i suppose yeah. so i think this particular section took about 80 generations to get to this final result just constantly yeah. redoing it and telling the ai yeah. i want this but not this don't do this but look more down this avenue kind of thing yeah and the prompting was very important yeah wow it's amazing. Um, another awesome. question I've got for you, Matt. Um, yeah. What sort of computer were you using know. to actually do all this? So I was working primarily on on my computer at home, which is a Windows PC with a NVIDIA 3070 and an Intel i7 12th gen, I think it is. Okay. So it's a, it's a pretty beefy computer, but yeah. even that wasn't powerful enough to handle the full scale of my panorama. Yeah. Because um, this file is like, it's an 8 gigabyte file with I think 64 million pixels in it. Amazing. So it's like, yeah, it's a massive file. It's, it's so big that the PNG file format doesn't even recognize files as big. So I had to export it as a TIFF file, which is. Yep. And then total. export it again as a, the final one as yeah. a PNG. Yeah. 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 So it took the files a while yeah. to. It takes a long time to that. open, close, and save them. Tim, this is a really incredible generation that you can just see here in the middle here um we think that one was probably the strongest, the strongest section in the strongest section in the image yeah. um so this is these are the two individual photos like that yeah um so the photo on the right starts at about there and then finishes around about there and then just telling yeah the computer generate a section in the middle and it generates that so good yeah there's some of the other versions that we had. Yeah, so we had some really great versions there. Mm. Um, we were we weren't sure in the end, were we? Because yeah. we had so many great ones. Yeah. And this again comes down to the um, Photoshop updating the generations um, mm. within a time within a few yeah. months, and we were getting better generations. So. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. And we do have a hand up, and I think it's Melinda. Would you mind just putting your question in the chat for us? That'd be great. And then uh, we'll ask that uh, the question to Matt or to Alex, depending on who you're asking it to. That's incredible. Um, I'm just trying to think in terms of um, the practicalities for another teacher or student to do something similar to this. It obviously doesn't have to be at this incredible scale, but the same techniques you could apply at a much smaller scale to get something done in a few hours rather than a whole year as well. But the concept of what you've done is incredible and been really, really impressed with it. What else did you want to share with us, Matt and Alex? Um, anything else you want to say? I'm not sure if there's much else. To... Yeah. Mark... I think we've both said what I feel that just in the last 12 months has changed in the platform. Um, but I also feel like for us, there was Photoshop definitely is you know, such a fantastic um, program that allows you to, you know, even download those FX mm. that we were able to mm. do with, you know, to match the type of film stock we wanted to use. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, I, anything else you wanted to add, Matt? I think I've covered all I want to say, yeah. Terrific.
Well, guys, really, really appreciate your time and sharing your talent. Would you mind putting the link to that site in the chat for the live audience? That would be wonderful because I'd love to get it. I can see Erin is very excited to get a closer look at what you've been creating. Erin Raithke, how are you going? You got a microphone? I am. Out oh, there it is. It should be working now. Uh, yeah, sorry, I had to step out briefly because I am rendering from Premiere Pro right now and having Teams open in a meeting at the same time. As you were talking about, resources on computers is so important when you're dealing with large files. Um, and I was actually genuinely surprised when you said that you work on a PC even yeah. though I do too, I would not have expected that a PC would have been able to to handle it. So um, at what point in your project did you actually sort of, I guess, reach your upward limit with your home computer and then have to switch to another device at, at school, I'm, I'm assuming? Yeah. Well, we're on, we're on the classroom computer now yeah. that he used. In, mm -hmm. It was probably towards the end. It was, of yeah, it was once it was all in one document that it was really yeah. necessary to start working on the computer at school. Um, yeah, because I'm super familiar with, with that thing yeah. of like, open the file, make a cup of tea, make a sandwich, <laughs> walk around, check it again, maybe go put on a load of laundry, come back just to wait for your file to to load and like shut down all yeah. other programs on the okay. on the computer. So I'm super impressed that you were able to get it done at home, even on a beefier PC. Mm -hmm. I know that it's an exercise in patience. So yeah. well done. Thank you. Yeah. Terrific. And Tim Cosgrove, did you have a question you wanted to ask Matt or Alex? Uh, it was just about the AI part, um, how you join the seams of the photos. Um, and it just, just looks so real, you know, the, the seamless, I use the word seamless because um, everything comes together perfectly. Um, was that something you practice or was it something that um, you just let the um, the AI in the um, in in the in the Photoshop to do do the work for you. So how do you approach that part? Yeah. So there's there's a lot of magic in getting two images that are pretty similar. So I'll share share the screen again. Um. So I found I found that when you had two images that matched really well, it did a really good job. Yeah. So in this case, we've got this path in the middle. It did a really good job to generate this this yeah this middle bit that's entirely fake. So. That path in the middle doesn't exist. Um, so that's that, I think that's the first step in getting a good transition. And your expose your color tones. Are yeah, yeah, and ensuring that the tones and the exposure are similar between exposure. the images. But then mm. the actual AI is surprisingly very simple. You just I use the marquee tool, and then you oh, select the marquee. The area, yeah. hit generate generative fill, and then go. Most of the time, I left it blank. Sometimes I give it a prompt, so I got like yeah a good alpine. Mm. I can't spell. Yeah. Like that, and then generate, spins its wheels, and then gives you a, an output. Yeah. And it's normally that simple. Sometimes I found that it's like you, you don't want to necessarily type too much in the prompt. Mm. You want it to be able to, if you've got two images that are very similar, exposure-wise, tone-wise, color-wise, it will automatically fill that for yeah. you. It'll recognize it. And yeah. it's recognizing yeah. that gap there, and it, it will seamlessly try to fill so yeah it just comes to playing around i think yeah there's a lot of child and error yeah in this. yeah it's all new technology isn't it like it the is. fact mm. some people are saying the more detailed the prompt the better but really in this case it's not it's the the, the, the less information in the prompt is going to give you the better result so it's it's new technology it's very much in its embryonic form but you're you're a bit of a pioneer matthew you're really starting this whole new world hey a final question from me um and that is some people are arguing that ai is taking over the world of creativity and it's going to be hard to be creative in the future because ai is going to be doing it all for us and therefore, there's a fair bit of criticism about us, particularly at Adobe, supporting AI and really pushing it. What are, what are your thoughts as a young artist yourself, Matt? I think embracing AI is going to be important in the future. It's, it's how, how do you balance true creativity with fake creativity? Um, yeah, to be honest, I haven't thought about it that much, but you just got to recognise that I think it's yeah. important in terms of the skill development, the skill, yeah. the skill's yeah. evident, the idea is there. But what we found, especially as a teacher of Matt, is that, you know, um, he's an excelling student. I can get, we can get to a certain point where you go, what's next? 
where where can I lead him because his work is already so great and that's where I kind of thought about AI with math was well let's take your work to the next level and it's kind of putting the icing on the cake uh, mm -hmm. you have a strong set of skills you have an exceptional understanding of the craft and that's where I think AI can really elevate mm -hmm. um, a work beyond our expectations yeah yes. using AI to, yeah yeah to push your work further yeah to push it further not to yeah. even in an, even in an ideation um, initial stages of work it can be handy sometimes to to visualize be able to visualize what you're thinking but we definitely used it it was an end point yeah all the work had been done and it was really the final thing we did the icing, the icing on the cake. Yeah, yeah the icing on the cake for, for the project mm. Look, one of the great joys in my job is I get to go to schools all over the world, really, and and just to see how our tools are being used by young people and potentially then to develop skills that they can go on into the future to create a job. And I, I love that the fact that you're thinking about how to use these skills at the next stage of your life, going into being a, a landscape designer and working in photography. And I really encourage you to keep pursuing that. And even if it doesn't work out job-wise, as a passion. And then to start formulating maybe your own little business and to start being entrepreneurial with these skills because it's amazing the opportunities that will come as you become more well-known as an artist in these particular areas. Matthew, really thank you so much for sharing your talent and sharing the work that you've done this year. Alex, thank you so much for sharing Matthew. Mm -hmm. it's been thank wonderful. you for having us. Thank you. Really appreciate it. So we're going to actually finish off now with just a couple of quick little announcements. Let me just quickly jump and share my screen again. Now, most of you would be aware that we now have a one-stop shop for K-12 teachers, particularly to go to, to, to find out about more events and resources that we have in the Adobe education team, particularly focused with ANZ, Australia and New Zealand. So I'm just putting that in the chat now for the people who are with us live. For those watching the recording, you can see it's adobeanzedu.com. I encourage you to keep checking that site regularly and that'll give you keep you connected with the world of Adobe and education in this part of the world. And of course, our Adobe Creative Educator Program, of course, Alex, you've done level one, haven't you? You did that not so long ago. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've, I've, done, I've done level one, level two. And yes. Yes. Excellent. Yes. Good. <laughs> and of course, you don't have to be a, a photography teacher or a media teacher or an IT teacher to do level one and two. Alex, you're a testament that actually doing level one and level two is a fairly simple, basic process. Yes. And it's more about the theory of creativity and the importance of creativity. The only software we ask you to use for these levels is Adobe Express. So it's a really simple way of getting into it. And we encourage Anyone who hasn't done level one or level two to come and have a look at that site that I've got there. I'm going to put it up into the chat for those who are with us live and those watching the recording, you can see the link and that'll give you some information about how you can get yourself into level one and possibly do level two if you've done level one. So that is it from all of us. Thanks again, Alex. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for everyone who's joined us live and those watching the recording. We're about to do our little farewell video, and in that video, there is a feedback form, and I do encourage you to fill that out. I know it's a little bit time consuming. It takes about a minute, so if you wouldn't mind completing that. As uh, Molly, one of my colleagues, often says, your feedback is a gift to us, and it just helps us make these sessions delightful. I will dig up the feedback form and put it in the link to make it easier for those who are with us live. Otherwise, thanks again, everyone. All the very best. And we we'll look forward to seeing you next week at our Adobe Teach Meet. That's our final Wednesday webinar for the year, which will be on Wednesday, the 20th of November at four o'clock Australian Eastern Daylight Time. Thank you for being part of this Wednesday webinar from the ANZ Adobe Education Team. We hope you found it helpful. While you complete the feedback form via this QR code or link, note that Wednesday webinars are one of a number of free events and resources that we have for teachers as well as for students. Adobe.ly slash edu events dash ANZ is a link you should look up regularly, bookmark and share with your colleagues to find out what we have available. Thanks again for being involved in this webinar. We look forward to seeing you at the next event. Keep being creative.